thanks so much mo and the other organizers for this for this invitation this has been a wonderful seminar series i come every so often uh, really a great great benefit uh, for the for the community so thanks so much for for doing this for all of us um so i'll talk about some fairly um uh, newish work in the group um and um so before sort of diving in uh, i wanted to acknowledge the people who actually did all the work um uh the first uh, person i've listed here agnish kumar behara is a graduate student in my group um and um uh, uh he did almost all the work i'm going to, I'm going to tell you about uh, this was done in collaboration with um, uh, madan rao at ncbs and uh, uh, shrikan shastri at jncsr towards the end i might also talk a bit about some work that a post doc in the group matthew do uh, has done um this is something that started in the middle of the in the middle of the pandemic um over over many many zoom calls and uh, and emails uh, started off with an email chain between um be between madan shrikant where they included me so i'm really grateful uh, to them to have uh, introduced me to topics of this sort um and because it's a new topic for us um and it's a new area for for me um i'll try to keep things very simple um uh sometimes it also reflects the extent of my knowledge in that particular in that particular sub uh, area uh, i also will apologize in advance if i have missed any important references um, this uh, area as we as i'll sort of explain is very rich a lot of people have done uh, seminal work um, and i've tried my best to include all include lists of names but if i have missed anything out i apologize uh, in advance so with that um, i'll i'll start off um and uh, what i'll do is in the spirit of these talks try to um explain uh, what these terms mean and some of these things will, will be very very familiar to many of you uh, but uh, in the spirit of these the, 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 this talk i'll sort of try to explain what each of these terms mean and what we have done here uh, and also in the spirit of this the talk i'll first sort of uh, uh, confess that uh, uh, there are still question marks for us so all this is not done work it's not done and dust dusted um and so um uh, uh i'll explain what these things mean as we go along okay so um so the overall outline will be as follows um i'll first sort of um uh, uh introduce uh, or or uh, review this 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 very prototypical notion of um, of um, memory storage called associative memory storage and recall um i will introduce that i'll spend a few minutes maybe 25 minutes on that uh and then i'll talk about uh, our spin on this very old topic um where we make things active i'll tell you what that means why that why that we why we think that may be important uh, and then i'll end with some open questions that um uh, we think can be of interest to the broader community okay um I, and as mo said please uh uh you know uh write questions on chat if there's anything clarifying mo will ask me immediately and then we can sort of take it from there and i'm also happy to stick around towards the end uh to answer more questions okay um so i come from um uh, india I, i was actually born in a in this town labeled here way 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 way, way down south um and one of the characteristics of uh living in this in this part of india is you have uh, uh monsoons that come like clockwork uh or hopefully that still come like clock, clockwork uh, and so um uh, i have very strong uh, associations uh, with uh, uh, memories of, of of what the monsoons look like uh, this particular molecule here um is uh, a molecule that uh, bacteria release when the first rain hits the soil and um uh, for me this sort of uh, this this sort of uh, uh, initial stimulus uh, evokes a uh, strong memories of uh, the monsoons in india and and my and my childhood and so this basic process of sort of taking a uh, stimulus of one sort and associating it with memories associating it with instances um is called associative memory um and um this ends up being a very very uh, fundamental uh, prototypical way of storing information and retrieving um information um it turns out it's important for example um uh in uh things like the hippocampus if one wants to store spatial maps remember spatial maps uh it's important in many 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 um other contexts i won't go into all of them but what i'll first spend some time on is um just trying to unravel the biochemical basis of how something like this uh, associative memory can emerge how you can 
relate a stimuli of one sort to um, uh, a certain kind of an action or a certain kind of memory. And after that, I'll go into uh, how one can wrap statistical mechanics around this biochemistry. All this is work done by giants in the field. So I'll sort of talk about what they have done and then we'll come to our own work. Okay, so how can this kind of a thing happen? Um, and this uh, can be seen in many, many different ways, but I like this particular example um, where uh, you can you can, uh, you can can um, train, for instance, flies. Uh, uh, you can show them different kinds of odors. Uh, and for some kinds of odors, you can give them a reward. And for other kinds of odors, you don't give them anything or you can actually penalize them. Uh, in, in, in simple organisms like this, you can actually see that as you keep... Um, as you keep presenting the fly with different with, with, with orders over and over again, and as you keep um, applying rewards or penalties uh, to, to these actions, you can actually see that new uh, biochemical uh, or, or new neuronal connections get built up due to biochemistry inside the fly's brain, um, very loosely speaking. Um, and this basic process um, can be explained or, or, or is sort of captured by the statement from Donald Hebb way back in 1949, uh, I'll just read it out. It's a, it's sort of a longest statement, but it's useful. When an axon of cell A is near enough to excite a cell B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in the firing of it, some growth processes or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells such that A's efficiency as one of cells B's firing is increased. The basic thing that this thing is saying is that if you have two, um, uh, two neurons in this case um, that constantly end up firing together because of some stimulus. Uh, the stimulus here is an order and a reward, uh, is, is an order. Uh, they constantly end up firing together because of because of this. They end up uh, getting wired together effectively. So the, the, the very colloquial way of saying this would be neurons that fire together, um, get wired together. And this basic biochemical uh, statement ends up uh, being at the heart of um, how uh, processes like uh, associative memory um, can be explained, can be uh, can be understood. Okay, um, I'll take a small detour away from from this uh, from this from this biochemical thing just for a second. Uh, it turns out that this flies the flies brain is really amazing. Uh, 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 the number of order inputs it has to sense and parse is is on the order of thousands. Uh, it only has on the order of fifty neurons for sensing all this information. Um, and the fly, it turns out, um, solves this classification problem. Um, um, by doing something that's that is very very similar to what we would now call a perceptron, um, uh, it has uh, the neural architecture inside the fly's brain. The way uh, inputs are received, the way inputs are expanded in, and channeled back into outputs, actually resembles um, uh, artificial neural networks, perceptron-like models. Just that all this can happen in a fly um, at a fraction of the cost required to actually train um, uh, an artificial neural network. So this is a Nice sort of uh, popular science uh, article that I found a few few months ago um, uh, uh, that that is related that describes uh, some recent work in the field, um, uh, uh, pointing how um, uh, ideas like natural language processing can actually be performed by the fly's brain, uh, but at a fraction of the cost um, that you would incur in an artificial neural network. So it's a it's it's a very useful. Uh, uh, a problem to sort of ponder about and think about. It's a detour. It's not about associative memory, but I just found this find this sort of tidbit uh, fascinating. Okay, um, so coming back, um, this basic notion of taking uh, stimuli, associating them with some kinds of um, uh, responses of memory uh, is called associative memory. The, the biochemical basis is uh, if you have neurons that always fire together, you wire them together. Uh, how can we sort of uh, wrap this in a physical framework? Uh, what's the statistical mechanical basis, if you will, for for this associative memory? Um, so, in order in order to get uh, make those connections, let's sort of take an example of um, something we all encounter in uh, beginning grad school: uh, the Ising model. So, this is a, a prototypical model uh, just for order formation. Um, and uh, if I have a very very simple ferromagnetic 2D Ising model, for example. Uh, and let's say I have this Ising model at a zero temperature. Um, I can uh, I can sort of, uh, the, the ground states of this model are states in which you have all spins up or all spins down. Um, I can recast this information in an associative memory-like language 
by saying or by calling these two states memories or by calling these two states patterns, um, by pretending that my uh, spins in their up and down states are like neurons that either fire or don't fire. Um, and if I make these kind of associations, you can sort of uh, start to get an associated memory like picture by, by doing the, the following thought experiment. Um, imagine you start off with this uh, initial pattern. So let's call this a stimulus. Um, if I have this kind of a Hamiltonian at play, this initial pattern is going to be resolved. The system is going to flow down from this initial pattern, flow down the energy, and it's going to arrive at this stored pattern. Uh, and so this is one way in which you can start to um, uh, you can start to uh, uh, maybe appreciate that you can take this associative memory uh, uh, paradigm, um, which uh, which requires us to think about neurons and connectivity, and maybe wrap it in something that's sort of more st familiar statistical uh, mechanical language. Uh, but this is obviously very very simplified. It's a thought experiment just to illustrate what can happen. Um, but can we go beyond this? Um, can we go and store multiple in different memories? Um, how do we sort of generalize this? So let me take one small step away from this. Uh, I should point out at this point that um, one of the first people to, to do this kind of an association association uh, and map uh, and, and come up with statistical mechanical bases for associated memory was John Hopfield um, way back in 1982. And there are many, many other, other people who have, who, have, who have left out right now um, uh, who, who did very similar work. I'll sort of list more names as I, as I go along, uh, but this is a, one of the foundational papers that sort of uh, set out these, uh, set out the basic framework. Okay, um, okay. so uh, let me sort of move away from um, uh, just uh, 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 images that are all yellow or all blue, and let's imagine we have uh, this portrait of a famous physicist or image of a famous physicist, and let's imagine coarse graining this, this down into a four spin system. Okay, so I'm going to take my pixels that are here, black and white pixels, and just for the purposes of making my life easy, I'm going to imagine that this is like a four pixel or a four spin system. So I'm going to interchangeably use the words pixels, spins, neurons as I go along. Okay, two black pixels and two white, white pixels. Um, if I want to store this information, um, as uh, a pattern, um, I can um, I can use the ideas that I mentioned, the biochemical ideas from Hebb, and I and I can say, hey, look, I can I can imagine um, taking this biochemical insight that neurons that end up always firing together have to get wired together, um, and what I can do is I can connect up the the neurons in this manner. I see that this neuron and this neuron in this pattern um, always end up going uh, being being black together so i end up putting a positive connection here this and this are always uh, uh, in in the opposing phases so i end up putting a negative connection here a negative negative i can i can put an extra positive connection here it doesn't really matter i just left it out for the purposes of simplicity but i can put an extra positive connection here so this is how i can transform uh, the information that or transform the biochemical insight from heb um, into uh, the spin in, into the spin like idea and what does what do positive and negative connections mean? They mean ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic couple. So that's what it means in this uh, in this in this language. And so with this kind of a setup, if you imagine starting off with an input that looks like this, in which I've provided this dark state, this gray state, this gray state, and I leave this free. Okay, so this is my initial stimulus. Um, and if I have this kind of a connectivity. The system will then, um, because of the because of the energetics implied by this connectivity, in which I have ferromagnetic connections here, anti-ferromagnetic connections everywhere else, the system will immediately find the solution it has to find, and it will, it will recognize or flow to this pattern in which you have two dark states and two gray states. Okay, uh, and so this is a, this is this is a manner in which one can sort of uh, take the Hebb-like idea, wrap it in an energy-like formalism in an energy-based framework and uh, uh, start to uh, store and retrieve patterns. So this would be a stored pattern. This process would be called, this process would be called retrieval. Obviously a lot of, lot of um, biochemical nuances, a lot of biochemical complexity, neural dynamics have, have been ignored here, but this sort of gets at the heart of this question of storing and retrieving patterns in the first place. Okay, so uh, this is good. If it's one pattern, um, what if we want to do many, many, many things? So let's say we have, uh, 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 let's say we sort of have the first thing we did. And uh, if you want to do multiple things, I have the same famous face of a physicist, uh, not so famous face of a cat. Um, 
and the fa the face of another physicist uh, what what can i do if i if i believe um, if i sort of follow hebb's uh, uh, words blindly um, and this is also how we end up learning things um, i'll first train my neurons to remember this then after that i'll come and train my neurons to remember this and on top of that i'll train my neurons to remember this uh, so can this work uh, there are multiple connections that you end up forming there are also crisscrossing connections um, uh, the, the neurons that support this kind of a state might not be very happy with this. Um, the neurons that support the cat's face might not be happy with any physics around it because, because cats and physicists just don't talk to one another. Um, and so this is all, this, this is a question of whether this can work and how much can we actually um, store. And this is a problem that was very, very elegantly addressed by uh, John Hopfield and many, many others. Um, um, it, but it turns out that um, if you do this kind of a training process and uh, you store patterns and you you start off with initial uh, you start off with some particular initial signals you can recover patterns up to a point you can you can recover them really really well after a point things change uh, and this sort of uh, leads us to um, uh, the uh, the Hopfield model uh, which I sort of already mentioned but I'll I'll, I'll do this more formally now. And it's a prescription for, for uh, taking Hebb's rule and storing patterns in a statistical mechanical framework and trying to analyze or understand how much can you store, at what point will you forget, are there limits to how well you can, uh, how well you can retrieve all these important foundational questions uh, that um, are important from, for, for neuroscience, you sort of try to ask them in a statistical mechanical framework. So let's say for now I move away from faces and I imagine these abstract uh, spin patterns. Yellow is downspin, blue is upspin for now, uh, let's say. And I'm just labeling these patterns out with these, with these labels over here. Um, Hopfield's prescription was very simply that um, if I want to store these patterns in, um, uh, in an energy-based Hamiltonian, I can do it. Uh, by writing down uh, uh, an Ising-like Hamiltonian of this form, uh, sigma i's are my spins, sig sigma i, sigma j's are my spins, j i j is a connectivity matrix. And this j i j matrix is basically built around um, the Hebb-like rule that I told you uh, in, in the last few slides. You imagine training, you imagine uh, uh, building up connections corresponding to each pattern and then storing them as ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, uh, uh, as, as, as ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic couplings. And all the dust settles, it turns out, you can write down this simple mathematical formula for the JIJs, and this just ends up being an outer product of the patterns uh, summed over all the patterns. So this is exactly analogous. It has This has exactly the same amount of information as the Hebrew idea I said, but this is just a mathematical formulation of it. Uh, and so now you have um, uh, an an energy based uh, you, have, you have you have you have an energy for um, uh, the spin like system, um, and uh, the hope is that these patterns end up corresponding notionally to at least metastable states inside uh, metastable states in your um, in your uh, in your energy um, landscape. Uh, you can also add a temperature to this thing, and this will this will characterize, for instance, um, uh, noise that is that is uh, an invariable consequence of anything in biology. Um, and you can sort of explore how much you can store, how much you can remember. So this, this is a very paradigmatic model. It's very very. I've, I've introduced this in a very simplified context, um, but expansions of it are applicable in many many other places that I won't have time to go into. Uh, I'll just throw up uh, a few references, a few papers. Uh, in the next few slides that sort of um, that re relate to all this, but there's many, many, many other extensions of this basic idea. Okay, so um, how does all this work? Just to sort of uh, uh, recap, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of repeating myself, but I but I find these things super useful to uh, uh, to to, to uh, try and understand this more carefully. So let's say I have um, a bunch of spins in my in my uh, in my system, and I store some patterns. Um, and if I create this kind of a coupling matrix, the whole idea uh, of this Hopfield-like model is that uh, in spite of uh, all the crisscrossing connections, there are conditions under which you can create this energy landscape um, in which, let's say, my stored patterns actually read out RB and DY, and I pick this image up from this very nice uh, PRX paper exploring how Hopfield-like models are 
um, uh, uh, can be uh, realized in an optical system. It's a beautiful paper. Um, that's why it's RB and DY. Um, and so if I imagine sort of storing patterns that read out RB and DY, um, the Hopfield model will ensure that the landscape created around them would sort of have this kind of a kind of a structure. It's obviously much more complex, but this is sort of a good caricature. Um, you store patterns roughly at the minima of landscape. They are point attractors of your landscapes. And if you imagine starting off with a corrupted pattern, uh, DY with a lot of corruption, with a lot of errors, uh, and if you evolve the system uh, and allow it to find the lowest energy metastable state around it, it will actually flow back and find this thing. So this is your in initial insight. This is your initial input and this is your final output. And so this sort of flows and this is associative memory. Uh, this is sort of associative memory in action, uh, broadly speaking. Okay, so um, uh, this is the basic insight that the Hopfield like models give you that um, if I were to plot an effective free energy landscape or effective energy landscape as a function of configurations, you sort of get this nice structure where at the metastable points of this landscape, you have your memory states um, and uh, all is well and good. But this is not all. This, but this is not. Um, uh, uh, this is not all uh, in the picture. There's there's more to it. Um, and in particular, if I end up create, if I end up sort of describe uh, defining this ratio uh, alpha, which is the number of patterns I want to store by the number of spins or the number of neurons I have. So alpha is, a, is, is like how greedy I I am or how much I want to remember. Um, there's actually it turns out a critical value of alpha. Uh, below which you get this, below which you get these nice um, metastable states guarding your patterns. Above this value of alpha, all hell breaks loose and you end up either having shallow minima, spurious minima, um, minima that the system, um, uh, uh, you, you, the, the patterns you end up storing are not protected in the way they're protected here. And there's actually a fairly sharp transition as you go from, uh, as you go from here to here. Um, and this has been worked out. Um, the physical, the practical implications of this is um, if you end up storing, if you, if you have regions with good recovery, you get this. If you have regions with bad recovery, you store information, you um, supply your initial uh, signal, your, your initial input, and all hell breaks loose. You get, you get all kinds of garbage out. And, and the basic, uh, uh, the very colloquial way of describing it, this is you have crisscrossing connections that end up uh, uh, destroying any memory um, you end up having. Okay, so just to sort of summarize again, and this, this kind of phase diagram has been worked out by many, 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 many folks. Um, if I have this kind of an axis in which I have um, alpha, which is my ratio, number of patterns by number of neurons, there's, there is, it turns out, a critical point. Um, um, I have memory recall in this region. I have no memory, memory recall over here. If I, um, uh, if I add, if I imagine that there's noise uh, in my system due to various things, just noise in biology, noise in how neurons fire, and so on and so forth, um, and if I model the noise as just a thermal noise, uh, which is not a horrible thing to do, but we'll come back to this in a few minutes. Um, and if I sort of call that a temperature, um, this kind of a phase diagram gets 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 a, gets another axis, and it turns out very very generally very very generally that you have uh, some kind of behavior that looks like this. Uh, the lines you get for this phase diagram are not jagged like this. I just drew this out by hand um, just to just sort of illustrate things. The, the, I'll show you an actual phase diagram in a few minutes. But you have memory recall in this region, and you have no memory in this region. Um, some parts of this phase diagram are reminiscent of the kinds of transitions you see when you have water going to vapor. Um, that's way down here when you're at the limit of very small number of patterns. But in general, the transitions over here are transitions from a memory-like region to a spin glass-like region. That's sort of what ends up uh, becoming important. But the main takeaway of all this is that there's a biologically plausible mechanism for memory storage uh, and retrieval if you're below the theoretical capacity. And um, uh, the way you link up your system uh, ends up governing, for the most part, how much you can store in this uh, in this kind of a, in this kind of a framework. And this framework, as I said, has been very very useful. You can expand this framework. Um, uh, this Hopfield model, for instance, is for for experts in the audience who think about neural networks, it's almost like a single layer neural network. You can sort of expand this out, and you can do other things. Just that even if you supply uh, things with a lot of noise, you can end up recovering things using the same associative memory-like ideas. Um, 
and there are very very there are more um, uh, there are more recent papers that point to connections between the hop field like ideas uh, and even things like transformers that are used in uh, in chat gpt uh, this is very broadly used uh, this is can be used for self assembly like problems classification like problems and uh, many 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 other things okay so uh, the basic uh, uh, this is sort of this sort of uh, is the uh, this is sort of this is this sort of almost completes the overview uh, or background material. Um, uh, what I've shown you is you have phase diagrams like this, and you end up losing information if you're in this region. And this brings me to the point where we got interested in all this, which is that a lot of these ideas, the remarkable ideas, very powerful ideas, uh, but the way uh, uh, the information, the way we sort of think about how much information is stored, how much information can be. Uh, accessed and realized is fundamentally tied to how your neurons are linked up. Noise just ends up being um, a, a, a something that is a detriment. Um, and the way in which these kinds of diagrams are typically uh, realized is you end, up, you, you end up assuming that your dynamics, the way you sort of model your noise, is like the noise that comes from a canonical heat bath. The system is, um, for the lack of a better non-technical term, the system is at equilibrium. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of these basic, uh, in, a, in a lot of the foundational ways in which people think about this, um, there's no expectation that the biological systems to which ideas like this apply, where neurons fire, neurons have different kinds of uh, uh, different kinds of filtering uh, cascades that filter their signals. There's no reason that the noise that should show up uh, should have the simple form. Um, and so the first question we asked along these lines is, what if I um, ask questions like this, but I change the nature of my noise? I make my noise uh, not equilibrium-like noise, but a non-equilibrium-like like noise. What do I mean by equilibrium and non-equilibrium? I'll get to that um, in a second. Um, but the question we were sort of broadly asking was, if we change the nature of noise, and we have the same kind of neuronal connectivity, uh, and we have the same notion of, how random the noise is, the diffusion caused by the noise, for example, so the, that measure is kept the same. Can we, for the same notion of connectivity, for a similar measure of randomness, can we start to cram more information into the system? Can we sort of get to points like this, where previously you would lose information and now you don't, now you have access uh, to that information? And uh, much more provocatively, and this is something we haven't answered fully yet, uh, but I'll try to get to this, can you actually get to situations where um, you take a system and uh, you add noise to it, and it surprisingly ends up remembering more information than what it would, um, and that's indicated by this bump over here, uh, uh, more information than what it would in the absence of any kind of a noise source. So can we get these kinds of counterintuitive cases where noise is not a detriment, um, but more, more, uh, more realistically, can we get to these cases where uh, instead of tuning how the networks are wired up, we can sort of new, use the noise as a way to tune in or tune out memory in this in this kind of a uh, system. Okay, so what do we mean by equilibrium and non-equilibrium noise sources? We are inspired by um, connections that people have made in a different field, in the field of active matter that I'm sure um, many of you would have seen in, the, in, in this series of talks and in many, many other places. Um, and uh, just to just to sort of um, uh, illustrate this point, let's imagine observing uh, uh, a pollen grain in water uh, uh, under a microscope. The kind of motion it undergoes to a very good approximation is uh, is a is a is a is a random walk, uh, is Brownian motion. If I um, and this is sort of and this kind of motion um, uh, can be well described by what we would call equilibrium statistical mechanics and everything that that comes along with it. Um, the kind of noise that I ha that I uh, that uh, that we have in mind uh, is inspired by by uh, models of noise in this active matter field. Um, so what I have here is a polystyrene bead, and this is this is an image from Paul Chaikin's experiment from an experiment from Paul Chaikin's group in 2013. The polystyrene bead is a catalyst up here, and um, this catalyst can catalyze the decomposition of um, hydrogen peroxide when you shine light of the right wavelength on it. Uh, and in the when this decomposition process is happening, when the system is uh, when the system is consuming energy in this way, um, the kind of random motion the single particle undergoes doesn't look exactly like this. 
uh, it has a persistent nature to it. It sort of goes along a certain direction. Then this catalyst has to rotate slowly. And, and as it rotates, it sort of changes its direction. And that's sort of the nature of the random walk. So this and this, on average, look the same. Uh, you can sort of tune this and this to have the same diffusion constant at, at long uh, at long enough time scales. Uh, but if you if you sort of look closely, there's a small notion of persistence to this. And it turns out that, um, and you can show this with uh, through mathematical arguments that I won't go into in this uh, in this talk. It turns out that if you add this very simple thing, this notion of persistence uh, into this noise, you can argue and you can actually show that systems that were previously equilibrium-like now become non-equilibrium-like. Um, they constantly are producing entropy as opposed to an, e an equilibrium system that sort of settles and finds the entropy that it wants to find. These systems are constantly producing entropy um, uh, at uh, uh, you know at a more um, uh, at a many particle level. These systems have been shown to exhibit very 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 interesting dynamical collective phases. And so this is again a video from an experiment from Paul Chaikin's group uh, in which they. Uh, tune uh, light off and light on. When the light is off, the system exists as a dilute colloidal suspension. When you when you tune light on, uh, you suddenly get these uh, 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 crystal-like formations forming um, uh, spontaneously. And uh, all that's happening when you sort of tune light, when you turn the light on is you're changing the nature of the noise to a first approximation. There are many many other things going on uh, from this to this kind of a picture. Okay, and so that's sort of what we'll we'll do. We'll sort of imagine. Um, uh, asking questions in which we replace noise sources like this with noise, noise sources like this. I'll call these uh, equilibrium noise sources or passive noise sources. I'll call these active noise sources. I'm going to ask what happens to neurons if I do this. Um, uh, there are many colloquial ways to describe phenomena of the sort. Uh, one of the one common way is you sort of uh, 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 you call this freezing by heating because you have energy injection constantly to the system, but the system seems to be in a frozen state. Obviously, these are we should recognize colloquial terms that that were that were that sort of capture the phenomena. Don't get into the physics, but it's sort of a useful colloquial term to have in mind. Okay, uh, and this phenomena can sort of uh, these kind of active matter systems have you see them in many 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 different uh, many many different places. Um, you see them, for instance, in bacterial suspensions. Um, uh, uh, Cytoskeletal, cytoskeletal and the, the dynamics, many, many other things. I won't go into all the places you see them, but the basic ideas are you see these surprising phenomena where you end up activating the system, you end up um, uh, changing how the system absorbs energy, you end up changing the nature of this random noise, and you get amazing new uh, material properties. So can we take the same kinds of insights, but ask uh, these questions now in the context of uh, systems with memory, systems that have these associated memory properties, uh, can, can be asked something like, can active neurons remember more? That's sort of the broad, simple question you're going to try and uh, work out. Um, and why should this even be something uh, that may have uh, 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 that 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 may be successful uh, in this in this canonical active matter example under normal passive conditions, if I were to plot out an effective landscape, it would look broadly like this black curve here, you just have this dilute suspension, which is the only stable form. But as you, if you turn on activity, um, to the extent that you can write down an effective landscape, in general you cannot, but to the extent that you can, you see that there's a new stable state that emerges, which is this clumped or a, or a solid-like phase. And so uh, taking this and just, just imagining applying this to the associated memory ideas, can we, can we uh, take systems or associated memory landscapes that were initially shallow because we, we got too greedy and can we add activity to these landscapes and can we deepen them uh, and make them make the systems remember remember more um, and remember more uh, robustly in everything i want to talk about um, activity is going to be completely agnostic to the nature of information stored um, and so i'm just going to add a random noise term i'm not going to sort of have um, it be correlated with the um, uh, information in any in any in any potential way. Okay, um, and so I'm going to do the same kind of thing. I'm going to imagine that I have multiple uh, memories in the system uh, that that are stored. Uh, they're going to be trained in the same way, in this heb-like way. And I'm going to focus in particular on one last memory I I, I store in the system. It just reads out um, uh, the name of the city I'm 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 currently in, Chicago. Uh, and it just, it just set up connectivity in this manner. And I'm going to play the same kinds of games. Um, I'm going to um, uh, have a system in which I have the normal dynamics 
in which I have um, noise sources that are passive. Uh, and then I have, I'm going to compare that with a, with a scenario where I have noise sources that have that are uh, active. And the only new thing in the active thing is that the noise itself is persistent. Uh, it can remember itself, but nothing else, uh, there's nothing else uh, changes. Um, uh, the particular simulations I'm going to show you first are simulations in which um, we have uh, a system of, of spins. Um, now, just for the purposes of convenience, we work with not with discrete spins, but, but, with, but with continuous spins. It really doesn't change anything. Uh, you have a Hamiltonian that comes from the Hopfield-like ideas that I, that I introduced. Um, there is a Lagrange multiplier on the spins just to make sure the normalization is what we want it to be. And I'm going to consider two cases, one in which I have a thermal noise. Um, this should not be a plus sign. This is just, I'm, I'm going to consider either thermal noise or active noise. That's what I'm going to consider. Um, the passive noise is, uh, is, is described as it typically is, uh, just it has delta function correlations in time. The active noise is going to be uh, correlated in time with uh, with an exponential correlation. And this time scale tau here is the persistence time that shows up. Okay, so that's the only new thing. Uh, I'm going to compare, uh, I'm going to sort of um, compare scenarios in which um, I have simulations at some passive temperature T and what I've labeled in this red box, TA. And this parameter is uh, uh, a proxy for the temperature in very, very simplified systems. Um, in these active dynamics, and it uh, it ends up capturing the diffusion, so on and so forth. And so I'm going to compare to the uh, systems that are simulated at a passive temperature T and systems that are simulated at at with active dynamics at the same temperature T. Uh, the system, active systems, do not have the exact same notion of temperature, so there's a lot of caveats for that, but I have to compare parameters, so that's what I'm going to compare. All right, um, and if you take these active systems and just for the experts in the audience, if you go to the limit of very small persistence times, um, you end up recovering all your all your normal thermal dynamics. And so all the limits hold the way one expects them to hold. Okay, so I'm gonna show you two examples. Uh, I'm gonna show you two examples now. Uh, first, I'm going to start off at this point here. Um, this is the phase diagram I showed you previously where you have a memory region uh, uh, the blue line was the memory region I showed you previously. And I'm going to start at a point which is outside this memory region. Uh, and if I simulate this with passive dynamics, I have stored this pattern Chicago. But if I start off close to the pattern with a small corruption that is not very visible to you right now, um, if I start off from this pattern, uh, what you see is that very quickly the system forgets it. You still see the system is trying to remember it. You still see some signatures of it. But that, by, by the time the movie ends, um, you've forgotten the whole pattern. It's, you, you can't see any, you can see very, very minimal um, remnants of what was previously uh, Chicago in this, in this thing. The system has sort of hopped out and gone away. Okay, so that's what happens in the passive case. And that's expected because um, uh, you are starting off in a region uh, that uh, you're starting off in a condition where uh, you have crammed too much information in, the temperature is too high, and so obviously you lost everything. If you do the same thing, but with the active dynamics, this is what happens. Uh, the system starts off at exactly the same point. There's a small amount of correction in the beginning. The system has figured things out. And after that, it just stays here. It just stays here for as long as you, as you end up doing your uh, simulation. And so this sort of illustrates how potentially there's something interesting going on that by changing the nature of the noise source, but having the same kind of connectivity, um, you are able to stabilize patterns uh, or, or retrieve patterns uh, that would previously have been um, uh, have been lost. So, this, so we found this interesting and you can ask, well, why does it happen? Can we understand how this happens? What can we do with this? Um, and so let me try to outline how we have thought about this. Um, I should confess immediately that I'll, I'll, uh, what I'm going to show you are a few approximate models. I'm going to show you a very, very simple approximation first. Uh, which really doesn't apply to memory, but it sort of builds intuition. I'm going to show you a slightly better approximation that we think um, is a good perturbative theory, but only in a very small regime. I'm going to then show you a dynamical mean field theory that should work in many, many regimes, but is completely unintuitive. Um, and, uh, and then I'll try to argue why these things should work more broadly in a few other examples. So we don't have a full full-fledged theory of why all these things happen. We don't have an exactly solved model for why these things can, uh, happen, but I'll try to sort of show you where we are and um, and how we think about systems like this. Okay, um, and so how do we explain this? Can we sort of think about this as 
neurons getting frozen into a memory state in analogy with this active matter example. Uh, so to do that, let's imagine, let me sort of um, uh, take a step back from um, uh, frustrated systems and all the frustration that comes with working on frustrated systems. Um, and let me think about uh, just a simple double well-like structure uh, or, a, or a particle and a simple double well potential. You can regard this as a memory, this as a memory, and you can regard this barrier as something that protects your memory states. Okay, so that's sort of the simplest, simple caricature. And let's do this thought experiment, and many, many people have done this before us, uh, but this is just for illustration, where we take a double well potential, a particular double well potential, um, and we simulate what a particle does in the presence of a passive noise. You know, the particle is going to hop around, hop back and forth, cross the barrier every so often because the noise is reasonable here, the barrier is not too, too, too much. And I'm also going to compare that with what happens if you have, instead of a passive noise source, um, an active noise source, a noise that is sort of correlated in time with the same notion of temperature. Um, and it's not very, very clear immediately from the movies, but you can sort of see that the system is, this system spends more time around the barriers, uh, around the around the minima, it, it avoids the barriers a bit more. If uh, you plot a histogram of all the points visited by the system here, by here and, and here, and you take the log, the, the negative log of the histogram, just to sort of plot it in a manner that is reminiscent of energy. This is not the best thing to do, but let's say we do that. Um, what you see will look like this. Um, the black uh, dotted line is what you get from the passive. That's the original landscape we set out with. This system, if I were to take a histogram, and if I were to imagine plotting it on this, uh, taking the negative log of it and plotting it, what you end up getting is a scenario like this over here, where you have what looks like an enhanced barrier. This is really a horrible statement to make because this uh, is just a static description of a non equilibrium system. But to the extent that uh, uh, for the purpose of illustration, I'm going to make these statements that it looks like you have a slightly enhanced barrier that protects your minima over here. Uh, and this gives some intuition for what active noise may be doing. If you have a memory-like state, uh, it may be that uh, for reasons similar to this, uh, although this is a one-dimensional system, for reasons similar to this, you maybe end up um, spending more time in your memory and avoiding um, crossings or effectively feeling a larger um, a larger barrier. This um, the the orange line here is uh, uh, a perturbative approximation to the exact solution uh, to the solution that is actually sampled here, and that sort of just showing that the the, the the simulations are sort of doing things that are reasonable or should are in the reasonable ballpark. Okay, um, but how do we sort of go beyond this? Can we sort of uh, uh, do stuff that goes beyond there, this? There is a clarifying um, question I want to ask. Can I ask it? So sure. there is a question from Daichi, and they're asking, can you explain how alpha is actually changed in your simulation? Are the number of ah. things changed, or are the number of things remembered in the system changed? Uh, we all we, we always we have a fixed number of spins. We change the number of things that are that are remembered. We add more patterns. Okay. We add more patterns. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so what we do is we um, uh, is is we sort of wanted to ask well how do we explain this in a slightly more rigorous manner? Um, we wanted to try and use. Uh, you know, foundational ideas that people use to study transitions of this sort, and that actually uses replica theory, uh, but now for a non-equilibrium system. So how do we do that? Um, we can do that, it turns out, in a, pertur in a perturbative way. It's not fully satisfying, but, but it's the best we could do, um, uh, best we could do so far. Um, and uh, the basic idea is as follows. It turns out that in the limit of small persistence times, um, the kind of distribution sampled by our system can be really well approximated. And this is a calculation you can do. Um, and we have, we have many people have done this before us, uh, but, and we can do this in the context of our spins um, and show that the system that is, the system effectively samples um, a landscape that is given by a Boltzmann-like form with a H effective um, and a T effective. And the T effective just ends up happening, uh, to, it just ends up being equal to the, to the active temperature in this case, the parameter T A that I talked about. Um, and the such effective is something you can work out. The algebraic forms are a bit messy, but the main thing that I wanted to sort of call your attention to is that the such effective has coupling constants that almost look like the coupling constants that are original Hamiltonian, just that the two-body coupling constant, which is V here, ends up being stabilized. 
we had to add a four body coupling constant because we had a continuous spin system uh, and that's just a small artifact of the kind of the way in which we're doing things doesn't change anything but both these terms which stabilize memories end up being end up being increased there are many many uh, symbols here i will just tell you that the, they are being increased right now there is a higher order contribution that also emerges that is somewhat detrimental to these patterns but that doesn't end up affecting how memory is stored so if you take this kind of an effective landscape and you plug it through uh, this, so, this replica theory, uh, you can actually get an analytical prediction for what these phase diagram lines look like in the limit of small tau. And that's what this is, what, what we have over here. So in the limit of small tau due to this enhancement of, um, in, uh, the enhancement of uh, the coupling constant strengths due to activity in a manner reminiscent of what happened in the one dimensional system, but now for all spins doing everything, uh, you get an enhancement of memory. It's a very small enhancement. It's a perturbative theory, um, but it sort of tells you that this may be one way to try and um, uh, understand these kinds of uh, these kinds of processes. Um, one can try to go beyond this, and we and we did using the so-called um, Martin Sijia Rose formalism, um, where uh, we write down dynamical mean field theory. Uh, we, we write down a dynamical mean field theory for order parameters that capture memory, that capture all the correlations. Um, and if you do that, out, pops, out pop phase diagrams like this, you have to at some point solve things numerically, uh, but you can write down a set of analytic equations. And you can see that um, uh, in the presence of activity, I, I'll, I'll sort of ask you to focus on this diagram first. Um, you can store inform you can store patterns up to a very very high value of t there's a value of tau that i've not told you persistence time it's tau of five in this particular example um the equilibrium case you could only store information up to a t effect of, of around one uh, but in the presence of activity uh, you can store information up to a much much high upper end notion of uh, temperature um, you can you can tune all this by tuning your persistence if you tune your persistence down to um if you tune your persistence down all the way to um, uh, all the way to uh, zero, uh, you end up getting all your equilibrium limits again. You end up getting everything like you had an equilibrium. Uh, but as you tune in your persistence time, and that's what this diagram is telling, um, you end up you can actually end up storing a lot more. Um, you can actually end up increasing your capacity. You can actually end up storing patterns that are closer and closer to the maximal capacity that the Hopfield model would allow, but at higher and higher notions of um, uh, temperature. So that's sort of what I have done, talked about so far. I'm running almost out of time. So I'll sort of try to hurry through the last few bits um, that uh, we've sort of, I've sort of told, shown you how uh, without changing connectivity, but just changing the notion of dynamics, one can start to cram more information in and you can sort of take, take regimes that were previously, uh, uh, that were previously not have recovery and you can start to get recovery in here. Now, what about this more, contra more uh, provocative thing where you actually cram more information than what was allowed at zero temperature in the passive case, um, uh, this is this is much more uh, interesting and tougher. We think it can happen in uh, in, in in systems that uh, go beyond the simple quadratic kind of connectivity. Uh, so, for instance, in um, uh, associative memory models in which you have large numbers of spins coupled to each other, uh, it's the, the so-called p-spin associative memory models. We have done some uh, preliminary calculations where we uh, expect that um, the kind of phase diagrams you see when you add activity actually go away and you have re-entrant like transitions. Uh, this is something we haven't verified numerically, but we think this is a possibility where wherein you can um, get to regimes where you can cram a lot more than what you were getting even at zero temperature. So adding noise is a genuine help on top of what you had before. Um, we can also sort of expand these ideas out to think about um, to think about uh, attractors that are not just point attractors. So we don't we don't remember just uh, we don't remember single images. We we, we remember uh, movies. We remember everything continuous. Uh, and so you can sort of generalize these ideas to continuous regimes. And we think that um, uh, active noise can potentially stabilize how um, you can transition between memories and you can actually uh, recover things more uh, robustly, even in, even in dynamical uh, regimes. So I won't get into how this works right now. I just wanted to put this out as an advertisement. Um, and in general, uh, we can also expand these ideas to things that are uh, not just spin-like networks. Uh, there's very beautiful work from my colleague, Arvind Murugan, who 
um, showed uh, who sort of laid out a framework. Arvind Varkan and uh, and his and his students who laid out a framework for how you can get associative memory like ideas in a mechanical spring like network and how we can store information. We can take those kinds of mechanical models of associative memory, add activity, and we can actually show that the same kinds of things work. You can improve. Uh, you can expand the region in which you have recovery. Um, we can also try these things out um, with model neural networks. So we tried this out with one particular model ne neural network, um, which uh, tries to solve the so-called phase retrieval problem. Um, and doing things in this kind of simplified way that we do, we found that uh, the loss functions that are sampled uh, can be much, much lower if um, in your update rules for your weights, you have some notion of persistence in a manner similar to what our associated memory like picture would suggest. Um, and so uh, in general, we think this is uh, this can lead to a set of ideas for how uh, non equilibrium activity can sculpt memory landscapes, can, can sculpt uh, rugged memory landscapes. It can enable more generalization and uh, it can enable better generalization and, um, uh, and learning. And it can make things that were previously non-recoverable and non-addressable, it can make them addressable. Uh, we're also thinking a bit about how these ideas are connected uh, to connect to uh, connect to uh, systems that are actually more honest neuroscience systems. I, I don't have time to get into that right now. I'll stop here um, and I'll take questions if any. Thanks. Thank you, Suri, for a wonderful talk. There are actually some questions, including a clarifying question, which was close to the end. So this okay. is a question from Ashesh. I think this is like four or five slides earlier. And okay. uh, Ashesh was asking, uh, in the T going to zero limit, yeah. the, the equilibrium and non-equilibrium lines merge, which makes sense. Yeah. Or are they yeah. a tiny bit different? Uh, they merge. They, 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 they always merge. Uh, I, I'm guessing Ashesh is asking about this thing here. Ashish, you can um, unmute yourself and uh, ask directly if you want to add anything to your question. Yeah, I, I was I was mainly asking about that in the P equals to zero limit. It makes sense to me yeah. that, that the equilibrium and non-equilibrium should merge. But you also pointed yeah. out some possibility of they being sort of the non-equilibrium being slightly larger than the equilibrium one, which I'm yeah, that is that is sure how to even think about that because in the P equals to zero limit, I would think that. They should always merge because there is no way you'd get more information out of a system uh, which would maybe correspond to a violation of the second law. I'm not no, sure I, 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 I completely, completely agree with you. So I think the schematic was actually an incorrect schematic. I think that's what you're pointing out. So the schematic, I should have drawn this as a bump over here. Okay. Uh, and over here, I'm guessing you're talking about this schematic, right? I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about this phase diagram. Ashish? Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. 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 So, so in this schematic, which is a schematic, I should have actually drawn a bump. And I apologize for that. Um, in this here, at t equal to zero, it's exactly the same. Um, and then it sort of goes away from it. So it's like a re-entrant transition over here. Does it make sense? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Oh, so, so the next question is from Vidyesh, and they're asking, does alpha critical increase with increasing network connectivity? So alpha critical is a ratio. Uh, oh, with increasing network connectivity. So what if you have three body, four body connections? Uh, yes, in general it does. So um, you would notice here that I have alpha divided by two to the power of p. So if you have p body connectivity in general, you uh, the number of patterns you learn would look like n to the power of p. So um, uh, for two body, n to the power of p minus one. So for two body, it's n. Three bo uh, four bodies. And cubes, so on and so forth. So you have, you have, you have a, uh, it, 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 it increases as functions of it. All right. Uh, so the then the question we have uh, is from Ashok, and Ashok is asking, uh, can you increase the maximum capacity of the Hopfield network by adding correlated noise? Ah, so that's I guess again, sorry, that 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 I'm guessing is, uh, so in 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 the. In a lot of the st stuff I showed you, uh, you have the same capacity here, uh, but um, uh, you know this should again be come down. Okay, but this is the sort of example we're sort of still pursuing right now, where we think we can. Um, it's a Hopfield light -like network, but it's with it's with um, it's with um, 
uh, it's instead of two part spins, it, instead of just terms like sigma i, sigma j, you have sigma i, sigma j, all the way up to sigma p talking to one another, p spins talking to one another. Uh, and, and in that case, the maximum capacity we think can be increased. We haven't verified this numerically, uh, mainly because you, this only works in the limit of large p, which is a problem for us to sort of think about. Um, but we have some analytical calculations that suggest this. Uh, in the canonical Hopfield, in the canonical Hopfield, Hopfield kind of a uh, model, uh, for a variety of reasons, we think uh, for the choices we have made so far, um, we think no. Uh, can I rule it out in general? I don't know. I don't think I can rule it out. But at least for the kind of things we have done so far, um, uh, no. Um, if one thinks a bit about this, um, if one thinks a bit about this one-dimensional example that I listed out here, um, you can imagine an extreme scenario where you have completely lost the basins. So you have sort of gotten so greedy that your memories are merging together. And if you actually add active noise in that regime there, you mm -hmm. end up getting a histogram with two basins. Now the issue is the height of those basins is not um, sufficiently deep uh, in comparison to the temperature you've added on to the, to the system. And so things can hop out really fast, but it points to a potential mechanism by which you can have correlated noise sources that interact with um, you know, how are you creating your walls uh, mm -hmm. to, to recover previously unrecoverable points. It might not recover everything, but it can, it can recover something. Mm -hmm. um, so I think ideas like this, when explored in higher dimensions, which is sort of what we are doing in the three-dimensional system, um, can, can actually work. Uh, but in the canonical, canonical Hopfield model, we don't, think, we don't mm -hmm. think you can increase the capacity with the noise choice we have made so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So then there is a related question, you know, question from Juan, and they're saying, in the simplest models of gene expression noise, we represent the intrinsic noise as delta correlated, and global noise as exponentially correlated. Does the neuron firing noise depend directly on expression noise? Oh, that's a that's a very good uh, that's a very good question. So. Um... I haven't explored this in I haven't explored this in in, in great detail. So I'll, I'll, the honest answer I'll say is I don't know. Um, um, I've just we just started talking to a few folks to see um, um, or to sort of to educate ourselves about how um, uh, the, the 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 recurrent neural networks that are actually found inside us or are found in our simpler simpler organisms are modeled um, and the sort of um, the first takeaways that 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 I that I uh, that I got from that, and I could be wrong in how I've interpreted this, is that um, uh, neurons filter through a lot of a lot of noise, and so it's not completely uh, inaccurate to sort of expect that the emergent noise that shows up is somehow is somehow a colored noise source, which is the kind of thing we are using right now. Um, and so it's, it doesn't seem like the it doesn't seem like the most uh, doesn't seem like a bad assumption at, on the surface. Uh, but I leave it at that. I I don't have a very detailed answer into how neuron firing is dependent directly on the expression noise source. I don't exactly know that. Um, I do know that uh, it's not unreasonable to model the kinds of noises you have as a colored noise source. I don't know if I completely answered it, but that's the best I I have so far. Thank you. Then there is another question from Vidyesh, and uh, the question is. Uh, there could be other ways uh, uh, through which we can increase persistence of the neural dynamics. For example, could there be other ways through which we could increase persistence of the neural dynamics? For example, adding momentum similar to heavy ball gradient descent. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So if you if you think about what what we have done, we have taken, for instance, this noise source, um, and uh, one way to model a colored noise source is sort of adding an extra degree of freedom. And this extra degree of freedom ends up being coupled to uh, ends up being modeled as a harmonic oscillator with with its own white noise. And so, so in some sense, we have expanded our our um, uh, we have expanded our space. Um, is it exactly like adding momentum? Is this is something that we have wondered about. I'm not completely sure yet. Uh, there, but there may be an analogy, and it's a yeah, it's a very it's a very good question to ask. Uh, um, and we haven't explored all those things. I think it's connected but um, I'm not exactly sure right now. Right, Thanks. so these were the questions in the chat. Do, uh, do you, does anybody else have a question they want to ask immediately and then they can unmute themselves? You can unmute yourself and ask. 
Otherwise, what I will do, Suri, thank you once again. I will stop recording. This was a great talk and a great discussion. I'm going to stop recording now. And then we will informally have an informal discussion where people can uh, you know, directly unmute and ask questions. And we have a more informal informal direction uh, discussion. So I'm going to stop. Uh,